do with the environment? A lot, actually. The connections between reproductive rights and health and the environment can most easily be seen through the issue of population growth. Everyone has the right to choose the number, timing, and spacing of their children, as well as have healthy children and be healthy themselves. Part of creating a truly sustainable society is ensuring that everyone has access to the information and services they need to empower themselves to make informed decisions. Sex is part of life. Reproductive rights in the environment are often considered separate issues, but they are in fact connected. First, I will discuss a brief history of international thinking around the relationship between reproductive rights, health, and the environment. Then, I will go over briefly population. And finally, I will show how these relationships are relevant to our current global reality. To start off, let me confront the elephant in the room. Many of you have probably heard of the term population control. Well, that's an antiquated term that does not adequately address the true needs and purpose behind these actions. It's not about control, it's about access. The old method was to have targets for a certain geographic region, such as reducing population growth by a certain amount. And aid organizations' funding would be tied to meeting these imposed targets. This mentality led to coercive practices such as forced sterilization in Argentina and coercive abortions in China. When information about these coercive practices came to light, there was overwhelming backlash from the developing world. The mentality was almost like, oh, if people over there just have less children, then everything will be fine. And that, that's almost like we're blaming the developing world for problems that were largely caused by the developed world. People in developed countries even became so uncomfortable talking about anything to do with population. Then, in 1994, the International Conference on Population and Development was the first time the international community rejected the notion of population control and reframed international family planning in a justice and rights framework including gender equality. However, the goals that many countries, including the US, agreed to in Cairo at the ICPD were not ever fully realized, and we still have a long way to go before we actually have integrated solutions to global problems. For example, one third of the federally funded dollars that former President Bush <coughs> allocated for family planning in Africa went directly to abstinence education. Understanding the history is important, but let's take a step back a second and make sure we're all on the same page about population. There we go. So this graph shows a timeline of how long it took to add each billion people to the world. The first billion took all of history until the year 1800. The second billion took 130 years the third, 30, then 14, then 13, and most recently, 12 years to reach 6 billion people in 1999. Today, there are 3 billion people in the world under the age of 25. That's right, youth make up almost half of the world's population. Population growth did not cause environmental degradation or water scarcity or other problems, but Population growth does exacerbate existing problems. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007 along with Al Gore, mentioned and included population in their climate change models. This graph shows the Population's Reference Bureau's projection of various possible trends we can have in population. If we stuck with the same fertility rate that we have now, we will have 12 billion people in the world in 2050. There are three alternative action scenarios, and the high one with very little action would mean we'll have 11 billion people, and the low one, the low scenario, with a significant amount of action, 
means we will have 8 billion people. Rates of consumption have risen faster than population growth in many areas, especially developed countries. So this means that even if we have a small population, it's not necessarily enough. We can still have large emissions that exceed global thresholds because of large, of large consumption rates. So having 8 billion people in the world in the year 2050 does not mean that we will have a just and sustainable society, but it will give us a fighting chance. Now, we've seen the history and trends. Let's look at the current reality today. Deforestation, overconsumption, environmental degradation, contaminants, climate change. According to the Terrestrial Carbon Working Group, one-fifth of the world's greenhouse gas emissions comes from burning or cutting down rainforests. But all hope is not lost. In their 2004 article, Stephen Pakala and Robert Sokolo showed that we can actually achieve stabilization levels for our CO2 emissions using current technology. This graph shows there are seven action wedges that make up the difference between the projected level of emissions and the current level. Professor Brian O'Neill of Brown University will show in his forthcoming to be published work that population, reducing population growth, can actually account for up to two complete wedges in this framework. The United Nations Population Fund found that globally there are 200 million women that want to use modern family planning but can't, don't have access to it. Furthermore, unsafe abortions cause 70,000 deaths annually worldwide and the number one cause of death for girls in developing countries aged 15 to 19 is pregnancy related complications. Um, I guess we can skip this. All right. So one example of an integrated solution to coastal and reproductive health is in the Philippines. They have community discussions and actions, some led by youth, that address the effects of overfishing, mangrove deforestation, and comprehensive sexuality education. Now we know it's working, not just because more and more couples are showing are using modern contraceptive devices, but also because more and more are citing the environment as one of their reasons. Don't forget to put on a condom, honey. Let's think of mangroves. So again, it's not about control. It's about access. Providing information and services so people can choose the number, timing, and spacing of their children is a foundation for a truly sustainable society. The goal is not simply to have less people, but to have stable populations. And above all, we cannot address global climate change without factoring in the three billion young people in the world. We have to give them the tools they need to take control of our world's future. So remember, the fate of the world is in your hands and your pants. Thank you.